Hello. Well, it's my job to bring the passenger pigeon back to life, not just as a science novelty, not as a zoo attraction, but back into the skies above where we actually stand right now, even Washington, D.C. This is native passenger pigeon habitat. Let's talk about passenger pigeons. They went extinct about 100 years ago, and having studied many of uh, their specimens and passages, I can tell you that no book and no museum collection can ever give you the majesty of what this animal once was. What we're really left with to imagine the passenger pigeon, the droves of them, is the prominence of art and these fantastic ghost birds and images. I want to bring them out of our imagination from this inspiration and get them back into the wild. Well, people can ask, Ben, how, how does a person get this job? That's me when I was 13. Yeah, yeah, uh, doing science fair. My, my academics goes way back. How you get this job is you become very passionate about it. I grew up loving conservation. And to me, when I looked at ecosystem level conservation, there were gaps. And I felt the future was in restoring those gaps, those extinct species, and ushering in a new age for conservation. And I wanted to get ready, so I started studying up on what would be the technological difficulties to overcome. And I did this science fair project at age 13, going on 14. Actually, I still have those pants. I wear those. About whether or not we could bring back the dodo bird. And what I learned was the dodo bird happens to be a giant extinct pigeon. I know it doesn't look like it necessarily, but it is. And it doesn't take too long studying extinct pigeons to come across the story of the passenger pigeon. This is the first image I ever saw of a passenger pigeon, and I fell in love right away. And what captivated me next was reading about the fact that there were billions of passenger pigeons, and within 100 years, they were gone. Really, within the span of a decade, we have a complete system collapse with this bird. And I think the question we raise here today, we've talked about mammoths, we've talked about bicardos and, and frogs, and the main question at the start of any of these studies is about your animal. Why did I fall in love with it? Why do I think it needs to be back into the wild? That comes down to what is it? The passenger pigeon has a unique color, a certain shape, a certain size, all things that are morphological, things that you might be able to breed back in some other type of pigeon but it has this very unique behavior that I want to impart to you today that makes it a keystone species that we're interested in. If we view forest ecology as a dance, the only animal that can keep step with the trees is the passenger pigeon. It's the dance partner of the forest, and it has a huge impact. And it comes down to its social structure, these dense flocks coming into a roost, depleting resources, fertilizing the ground, letting sunlight in. It's a biological storm that's rejuvenating nutrients and allowing many other animals to flourish. And all of this, the size, the morphology, the behavior, we can begin to start to understand, not just because of the historical context we have with this bird, but by starting to investigate its DNA. And from that DNA, we hope that we can actually bring the bird back. And so thinking about this, we need a certain set of ingredients to bring an animal back to life. Do we have DNA? Yes, we do. There happen to be 1,500 specimens of passenger pigeons worldwide uh, from museum mounts and fossils in collections that go all the way back to 10,000 years. Uh, the DNA and the fossils show us that the passenger pigeon has been learning the choreography of its dance with the trees for several million years. It's a, it's a very unique uh, dance, and it's a very amazing thing for North American ecosystems. I've actually sequenced some DNA out of several specimens, and to date right now, with some minimal effort uh, for our preliminary designs, in any form of quality, from really bad to really good, from one of these specimens, we actually have 500 million base pairs of mapped DNA reads. That's half of the entire genome. So we can get the entire genome. We can work with this bird, but we need a genetic parent for it, and that's the band-tailed pigeon. Recent DNA studies show that that is the closest relative. It's a northwest coast to west coast, all the way down migrating into Peru of South America. That's its native range, so it's another North American bird. Uh, familiarize yourself with it because it's really, really neat. Um, and when it comes to epigenetics, other factors that people might question, you know, cross-cloning, things like this, the amazing thing about pigeons is 
for the technology we're going to need to bring them back, it's not just about recreating a genome, but breeding them, getting them going. People have been breeding pigeons captively now for about 8,000 years. We're pretty good at it. We've been breeding many different exotic breeds for hundreds of years now. And for the last few decades, people have even been hybridizing different species. And we're learning that different types of pigeons work very well together on the cellular level. So the big question we all have, of course, is habitat. Is there passenger pigeon habitat? I just said that this is a dance. Is the ballroom still set? Are there people waiting to see this happen again? Those people happen to be our forests. This is North American forest cover of various states. There happen to be many national forest areas, ideal locations for re-releasing the bird and breeding the bird, all of which happen to transect former migration paths and breeding zones of this bird. This habitat is here. Not only is it here, it's growing. In the last 10 years, the United States has seen 15,000 square miles of forest come back from abandoned agriculture and logging sections. There is more passenger pigeon habitat every year. So how do we make it? It comes down to three major phases. And don't get me wrong, these are really, really big phases. They, they're not bullet points like this. Creating a genome, getting it into a cell. Coaxing that cell into being a bird. And taking that bird and repopulating it into a flock, the providence of conservation biology as a whole. I'm here to tell you that we are building on things that already exist. Conservation biology has been bringing back birds for a very long time. And sequencing these genomes, we get to work on Hendrik Poinar's expertise, Beth Shapiro, who will be speaking later. All of these people have been working out the tools so we can do this. And it starts by assembling DNA. Here we have a band-tailed pigeon DNA sequence with passenger pigeon DNA fragments mapping to it. The overlapping regions are how we synthesize this back together in the computer as our data. A problem with ancient DNA, there will be a lot of false mutations. So we need enough coverage to overrule these false mutations, get a consensus of those passenger pigeon fragments that give us the passenger pigeon DNA. There happen to be four mutations in this sequence that matter. But are they expressed? Are they evolutionarily important? We translate that to a protein sequence, and of those four mutations, only one of them actually produces an expressed change. Is it a significant change? Just so happens to be a very significant change. The chemical structures of those amino acids are very different. This is the kind of mutation we need to insert into a band-tailed pigeon genome to recreate a passenger pigeon. So using George Church's uh, advancements, we can synthesize a piece of DNA with that mutation and rewrite it into band-tailed pigeon DNA, repackage that DNA into a viable cell, inject those cells into growing embryos, and raise a generation of various sorts of chimeras. This is how we intend to do this project. It'll most likely change as we start building information and things advance. This is our greatest technological challenge, this step right here. But it pales in comparison to actually trying to make the bird a natural passenger pigeon again, which starts now from day one. Imagine you're a passenger pigeon chick. You hatch, where are your parents? That's kind of an issue. With modern conservation efforts, people have used puppets to be the parents, to prevent imprinting confusion. With pigeons, we have a bit of an issue with that. There's a, pigeons have a biological factor that makes them very dependent on their parents that you can't simulate with a puppet. This is where art is going to inspire us again. These are not photoshopped. These pigeons have been dyed the same way you dye your hair. It doesn't hurt them. The, they'll shed the feathers. They'll go back to their regular color. So in this vein of thought, when our first baby passenger pigeon hatches, it doesn't have to see rock pigeon surrogate parents, but it gets to see passenger pigeons, at least cosmetically. And this is where working with a passenger pigeon is going to be different than many other extinct species and why I'm advocating that we should work with the passenger pigeon. Passenger pigeons are not good parents. They abandon their young before the babies can even fly. There are very few birds that do that. So, for the behavior, that whole social structure, developing that, 
that's really left for the babies to figure out on their own. And there will be an amount of that that's hidden in the DNA. But we can simulate exactly how it happens because we have the historical records of people who bred them in captivity and studied them in the wild. And I'm going to paint you the story of a baby passenger pigeon right now. It hatches. Two weeks later, its parents go, oh, you're fat enough, goodbye. And it's left there, sitting in its nest for two to three days before it learns how to fly. The only other birds around it are all the other baby passenger pigeons, and they form a cohort, a little juvenile flock that strengthens and flies around. They experiment with some food, become adults. And then when an adult flock migrates by, they join that flock. And that's how they learn where to migrate and where to go. Now, passenger pigeons, they don't migrate uh, to specific destinations every year. They're migrating based on resources. This is something critical to know about the passenger pigeon. It's an opportunist eater. It's dependent on the mast of trees. And so it cannot outgrow the forest. It cannot step out of time with the music that's playing. And it's very easy for it to adapt into its former environment because of this, because it can eat many different things. It can try out many different things. It can learn a great deal all on its own. But how do we make that adult flock so that they actually start migrating the way they used to? And that's where modern pigeons and being able to train them is going to be our salvation. Surrogate flocking, that's what I've been calling it now. We cosmetically paint a whole bunch of white homing pigeons, once again like passenger pigeons, and homing pigeons can be trained to fly from one site to another. So in our first release to the wild, we bring a captive flock. We've got a viable flock now. We bring it into an aviary. We let them raise a generation, let them form their cohort in their environment. We take some homing pigeons, and we let them ferry them to the next spot, designated spots like so, to their late autumn roost. We let them get reacquainted with the forest the way they would be migrating to an aviary out in the woods. This is called a soft release. It allows them to get used to their environment without being exposed to the actual dangers of the wild. Because if you've only got 10 passenger pigeons, you don't want falcons coming in and dwindling that down. So then we're going to ferry them with a homing pigeon flock down to a winter zone and back to the breeding area. And this is where replicating the, the migration behavior for the future is important. We don't want to bring them back to the same breeding site. We don't want the future passenger pigeon to start thinking it goes to one spot every year, because that's not what passenger pigeons did. They're resource dependent. They're wandering around. So we have multiple sites. We bring them back to a different breeding spot. They raise a generation. They fly to a different autumn spot. And we start mixing and matching every year where this flock goes. And after two or three years, we've had a generation of passenger pigeons that have flown the same wing beats as their historical predecessors. And then we slowly take away the surrogate flocks, let the first generation ferry the next. We take down the aviaries, and we get to witness the passenger pigeon rediscover itself in the New England and Great Lakes forests of North America. And I think it's really important at this point to recognize something about the restoration of the passenger pigeon the trees in your backyard, if they're 150 years old, which many of them will be, they remember the feet of passenger pigeons perching on their branches. The trees of our forests today had passenger pigeon nests in them. Not only is the environment available for them, but it's the same. We're the ones who have forgotten the passenger pigeon, and we have the chance now to restore it. We get the chance to completely redevelop an understanding of this bird. And to me, the passenger pigeon then is a beacon of hope for conservation of the future. It's a major signal of change for success from losing species to gaining them back. And I don't think in a 15 minute presentation that I can give you 15 years of my work that will be to come. But I hope that you join in in the next few years and you begin to share the same passenger uh, pigeon passion that I have. And this can be not a success for a group of scientists, but an achievement for our time and our world right now for the rest of the future. Thank you.